This is going to be a walkthrough on how to do the problems in Delta Math for homework seven, topic seven. Had a lot of questions, so I think um, it's worth trying to talk through this. Um, I'm going to do one problem from each one, and there's one section where I may do more than one. So the first problem in the first section says find the average rate of change from the equation. Here we're given a function f of x equals x squared minus 6x plus 1, and we want to determine the average rate of change for the function from the interval negative 1 to 4. So when I did this in class, I used h between, so it would be like negative 1 plus h, and h was, um, so we did it all more symbolically. So this is kind of bringing it back down to actual um, numbers, which is a good way to kind of get things pretty solid. So I'm going to just write this over here. So we have an x squared uh, minus 6x plus 1. And we're going to want to evaluate the average rate of change. So it's the average rate of change formula, which we um, did in class, but we're going to now do it instead of, um, it's going to be f at x plus h, and here is going to be the right-hand side. So we'll say it's f of 4, and actually let me make this into a fraction. So f of 4, which is the, um, it's really, if x is negative 1, that's an h of 5. So we're going 5 to the right. f of 4 minus f of negative 1, and we're going to divide that by um, x2 minus x1. So f Four minus a negative one. Okay, and this is going to then equal. Um, so f of four. Let's go ahead and plug that into our equation. Is going to be four squared minus six times four, so or twenty four plus one, and we're going to subtract from this the function evaluated at negative one. So negative 1 squared is 1, uh, minus 6 times negative 1 is plus 6, and plus another 1. And hmm, put parentheses around this whole thing so that my little equation editor will make it into a fraction. I'm going to divide that by 4 minus a negative 1, or 4 plus 1, which is 5. Okay. And this is going to equal, so we have um, 16 minus 24 plus 1, and we're going to subtract uh, 1 plus 6 plus 1, which is 8. So we're going to subtract 8 from this, divided by 5, and actually, why don't we just keep going um, here. See, we're going to equal, so we have, um, let's just do that real quick. I'm going to do it on my calculator. So it's 16 minus 24 plus 1 minus 8, and I get negative 15, okay? So we have negative, negative 15 divided by 5. And that's equal to negative 3. All right, so our answer is that this is negative 3. I'm going to come over here, and we're going to write in negative 3. And we're going to submit the answer. And we're good to go. Okay, let's try it one from the next type of problem. Average rate of change. The function y equals f of x is graphed below. What is the average rate of change of the function on the interval from minus 6 to minus 1. So the um, advantage for this problem is that um, we don't have to do the math that we had to on the previous problem. We can read the points right off of this. So for this problem, we're going to say that we want the average rate of change. So let me just go ahead and state on here that it's from minus 6 up to um, negative 1 that we're interested in. So in order to do this, what we need are the two points that correspond with this. So um, if I look at x equals negative 6, I see it has a y-coordinate of negative 12. 
So I can say that point 0.1 is a negative 6 and negative 12. And that point 2, right, I get my points from each end and because I want the average over this interval, so I want to get the point at each end. The, point, the value of the function at negative 1 is going to be, looks like a negative 2. All right, so now that I have this, the average rate of change for this function between negative 6 and negative 1 is the slope of the line connecting those points. Um, and the slope of those, that line, right, so the average rate of change and I noticed that delta math calls it rate of change, like rock, okay, is going to be um, this um, y, sorry, y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1, right? And so for us, this is going to be, let's go with the bottom point as the 2, right? So we got um, minus 2 minus a negative 12 divided by <clears throat> negative 1 minus a negative 6. And that's going to equal uh, minus 2 plus 12 divided by minus 1 plus 6. And that's going to equal 10 divided by 5, and that equals 2. All right, so our answer is that the average rate of change is going to be 2. So let's put that in, and we see that the secant line connecting those two points has been drawn in in green, and we see below this, the work that we just got done doing over here on the right. So we're good to go on that. So that's how you do those problems. For the average rate of change from a graph where you draw the line um, type set of problems, for this, this one is showing a, a function below, and we're going to plot a line connecting the points from x equals 0 to x equals 1. So to do that, um, we're just going to click here, and then we're going to Click here, hold on, click and draw to point one, which is here. There we go. So it drew this little segment of a line for me between zero and one. And now it's saying, okay, well, what's the change in y? That's what the triangle means. The triangle means what's the change in y? So the change in y was it went from 12 to 10. So that would be a change of minus two. And what's the change in x? We went, well, we went from 0 to 1. So the change in the x direction, or the run, so this is the rise over run calculations, is 1. So the average rate of change is negative 2 divided by 1, right? And that's just negative 2. We can do that one in our heads. So we're going to submit the answer for that one. And we have the answer. Okay, so that's how you do those problems. The next one is finding a secant line numerator limits, find secant line limits numerically. Okay, so for this one, this is starting to get to the idea where we're looking at reducing the add-on, like as I told you up here, you could view this um, on a previous problem, you could have viewed this as x, um, let's just go with x sub naught for like that's how it starts, sorry, x sub naught. So we started with negative 6 and um, the h is equal to a uh, positive 5, right? And so then that gives us what we, if we plugged into our standard formula, we would be looking at x equal negative 6 and x plus h equals the negative 1. So that's where that's coming from. So what we're going to do 
is actually do that now over here with this function. Come down. So our function now is f of x is equal to x squared minus x minus 25. So for this problem, what we're going to need to do, and I've typed the problem here, is um, solve it for, um, if you remember, we want to solve this for, we want to solve f of x plus h minus f of x over x plus h minus x. And this is how we get um, the slope of the secant line, right? So this is the slope of secant line. Do it in all caps. Slope of secant line, which is equal to the average rate of change, which I believe in Delta Math they use the um, a R O C for rate of change acronym. Um, and we saw that that this was actually going to equal. Uh, let me just simplify the denominator. Come over here and we'll simplify that. So here we're going to need to, first of all, because we're starting at the interval of three, so this is, we're definitely going to need, that's the f three and the f of three that we're going to need. So we have x equals three, f of three is three squared minus three minus 25, and that is equal to negative 19. So when we start with h equals 1, can't get it, lowercase, there we go, h equals 1, um, what that is means that x plus h, so x plus h is going to equal 3 plus 1, which is equal to 4. So then we're going to need f of 4, and so that's going to equal four squared minus four minus 25. And that's going to equal, let's put that in my calculator, and four squared minus four minus 25 is equal to negative 13. Okay, so now we have all the numbers that we need to build this um, value of the average rate of change, or you can also think of it as a slope of the secant line. Let's go ahead and put that in. So the average rate of change is going to be f of x plus 2, which is our negative 13, and we're going to subtract the negative 19, and then we're going to divide that by the h, and in this case, h is just 1. All right, so I'm referring right now, I'm looking at this equation right here, and I'm remembering that's, that's the formula I'm following. Those are my instructions. So I got this, and now I'm going to just simplify this. So I have minus 13 um, in the numerator. Everything's divided by 1, so it's just really all in the numerator. So minus 13 plus 19, and what I get out of that is a positive 6. Okay, so that's the first answer in this box. I'm going to put in a 6. Now the next one um, is going to be, I'm going to follow this pattern now, and the idea is I'm, I want to see what the average rate of change is approaching as h gets smaller. Okay, so now what we're going to do is fill in the rest of the table um, using the same procedures. We just have to repeat them three more times. The difference is that the h is now getting smaller and smaller, so our value of uh, the x plus h, so how far away we are from 3 on the x-axis, is getting closer and closer to 3. So for h of 0 0.1, we are going to, um, let me just set that up a little differently. There we go. Um, h of 0 0.1 gives us an x plus h of 3.1. And then we want to know the y-coordinate that goes with that point, and it's um, 3.1 squared minus 3.1 minus 25, or negative 18.49. So the second point is this um, 3.1 comma negative 18.49. And this is the um, num This is the point that we're going to use to find the 
average rate of change between that point and this point up here, which was the x and y was 3 and negative 19. All right, and so we plug that into our average rate of change formula. So we put, take the y2 minus y1, um, the negatives cancel, and we divide by 0 0.1. So we end up with a 5.1, and we're going to put that in our chart. Then we're going to repeat this again for 0 0.01. So now again, we're going to be even closer to 1 because we're going to be at 3.01. So that's how close we're getting to 3.01. We evaluate the function. We get a, even, a number that's even closer to negative 19, but we're a little bit below it. And you can, um, I'm sorry, we're a little bit above it. You can see we're going to be coming down on the curve heading towards that negative 19. We're not quite there. And at point zero 0.01, we evaluate the average rate of change using the, this is our point 0.2. So I could say point 0.2 is, just to be clear, is this neg is 3.01 and this negative 18.9499. So that's the point we're using for y1, uh, x2, y2, along with this point, which is our x1, y1, right? So I could say, just to, in case you're still trying to put all the pieces together, go ahead and put this in here. This is our x1. y1. All right, and each one of these points along the way has have been our, a different x2, y2. So every time we're just picking a point closer and closer and closer and recalculating the average rate of change. So at point 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.0001, we're at 3.01. That's going to be our x coordinate. And our y coordinate corresponding to that is now um, this number that's even closer to negative 19. Right? So now we're, we're like really, really, really close. We're like right there. We're going to connect those two points with a line and find the slope of that line. It turns out to be 5.001. So that would be the last number that we would want to enter into delta math into this table. And my um, delta math, I'm sorry, my word froze on me. So I had to stop and help a student in between, and now I lost that problem. So the next type of problem that we're going to look at is the same thing we just got done doing, except that we're going to just do it graphically. So um, here, I'm wondering, if, do I need to make this a little bigger? Oh, yes. Here we go. Sorry. I had to make my screen just a little bit bigger to see it. So we have this problem where we get to kind of play with the graph. We have a yellow dot that's fixed, we can't move it, but we have a blue dot on the curve, and we can move it along the curve. Up above, um, it's going to automatically tell us how close the x-coordinate of the point is. So it's telling us how close the x-coordinate is to 4. So it's 4 plus 3.4 is where we're at, and um, if we have, and it, and then it puts a dotted green line, which is the secant line, or some people call it the cotangent line. It's the line that connects two dots on a curve. And then over here, what um, delta math is doing for us is it's kind of um, going ahead and doing the secant slope calculation that we were doing over here by hand. So now you know what it's doing. It's putting these numbers in. So 4 plus 3.1 minus f of 4 over 3.1. What we don't know is the function definition. All we know is the curve for it, and that's okay. We're just trying to get a feel here for what happens as we move our blue dot closer and closer to the yellow dot. Our h value is getting smaller and smaller, and it's calculating every time we stop that blue dot, it's calculating the slope of that dashed orange line. So we see it's 1.30647 right now, and we're supposed to go as close to as we can, um, and then we can zoom in further. One thing that's important to understand, and we, um, it's important to understand like mathematically, but it's not something we're going to encounter a whole lot in business applications. But delta math is including the problems where the derivative doesn't exist. And one way that that you know the derivative doesn't exist is if 
you are approaching the blue dot is if the point is approaching from the other direction and it's approaching a different number on the slope. So right now this slope is looking like coming from below. The blue dot's coming below. It's like 1.17711. And um, I think that's as close as I can get in until I hit zoom in. And basically it's going to allow me to zoom in now. Now between each of the numbers on the x-axis is 0.1. And now it's going to allow me to get even closer. So I can see that I'm approaching 1.1955648. And then if I go to the other side, I'm at 1.2 just above that. So I'm getting closer and closer here. And I'm going to be able to zoom in, I believe it's three or four times. So now I've zoomed in, any for, zoomed in any, almost now to where the increments are 0.01 between um, the little grid lines in here. And I can zoom in either above by 0 0.001 or below by 0 0.001. And in both cases, I'm approaching this slope value of this line between these two points of 1.2. So I can zoom in once again. It's going to even let me go even closer. And again, I can come in super, super close from below. I get the same number in the limit. I'm coming, I'm approaching the same number. So this is just below 1.2. For the slope and this one's just above. So finally I can finish and I can say okay based on that little exploration I'm going to say that the that at four if h went all the way to zero that it would actually end up being at 1.2. And so you submit that answer and that is correct. So the next kind of problem oh we missed the little video there of seeing it do it for us. Um, well, the next one, we're going to write a derivative. And these problems are actually fairly easy. Um, this has a natural log. Don't let that throw you. All we're going to do is go ahead and plug our formula in for the limit. And that's just the area um, under the curve. That's this line right here, this formula right here. Sorry, the um, average rate of change. So we're going to use this uh, slope formula, right? y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, which ends up being just f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So we're going to plug that in here using this function now. And we want to determine the instantaneous rate of change of f at x equals 5 using the limit shown below. You, you do not have to simplify your answer. So all, all that's going on here is we're going to say, OK, f of x plus h. So we'll let me go ahead over to here to the side and kind of show you what's going on with that. So we have, um, let me see, let me go ahead and call this f of x is equal to 2 ln of x plus 1. All right. And let me just give us a little space so we know we're in a whole new problem. Okay, so coming down here. So what we have to do to plug into that formula is get a f of x plus h. OK, um, and in this case, we're actually going to be talking about f of x plus 5 plus h. So we're going to, first of all, get, um, we're going to set x is equal to 5. And then we're going to have um, f of 5. We're going to plug that into our formula. And this is going to equal 2 times the natural log of 5 plus 1, right, which is just equal to 2 times the natural log of 6. And that's going to equal, well, let's just leave it as 2 times the natural log of 6. Um, because I was looking at the instructions in Delta Math that says you do not have to simplify your answer. So let's leave it there. Now we're going to look at x equals 5 plus h. And so what we need for that is we're going to need f of 5 plus h. So we have this little increment, and it's 2 times the natural log. Now what we're going to do is we're going to replace the x with 5 plus h plus 1. So this is simply going to be 2 times the natural log of 6 plus h. So we're going to use that now to build this um, quotient. So let's go in here and we're going to say this is the limit is going to be 2 times um, 
the natural log of 6 plus h, and that's going to be minus 2 times the natural log of 6, and that's all going to be in the numerator. Okay, and then we're going to divide the whole thing by h. Okay, now when we work with polynomials, I told you you could always factor out an h. When you're working with something like a log, it, you can't factor it out. Uh, but if you were to estimate this, um, there's more advanced calculus ways of actually getting this to be the answer. And we'll be talking about the derivatives of natural log next time. But this is just the unsimplified written out form of the limit. Okay? So that's all you need to do for those is write those out. And... Um, the next kind of problem is going to be estimate the derivative from a graph. And this is a really, really important topic because for this topic, you really want to get an idea of what this whole derivative is trying to tell you. All right, so remember, f prime of 5 is a synonym for the slope of the tangent line at 5. So I'm going to try and draw that here. So let's say I come over and I want to draw... I want to find 5, and I'm going to draw a line that is an attempt to draw a line that's tangent to the graph at 5. Okay? Now that we see that, um, it, what you can tell me about this line, and I should have scrolled down because I don't think my annotations will scroll with me, unfortunately. Um, so I, might, I don't think I can move it either. Yeah, it's not going to let me move it. Okay, but at least we can, we know enough from what, that drawing to tell us what we need to know, which is if you look at that line, um, we don't care about the value of the slope at this point. What we care about is really, really important characteristics about it. Basically, we want to know if it's horizontal, which means that the slope, the tangent line at 5, would be horizontal. That would be something we would get maybe more over here at 4, right? At 4, we have a horizontal. Um, but what we're trying to decide here is if the slope is positive or negative. And since this line is decreasing from left to right, we say that the slope or the derivative there has to be negative. And that's all we have to do. One of the things that I did not cover in our course yet, because it doesn't really come up in business examples, is a corner. So whenever you have a, a sharp corner, as you see in this graph, that we were asked to find the derivative at 6, we would have to say it does not exist because, like I said before, the derivative has to be the same or the slope of the secant line has to be the same coming from the left or right as you approach the point. And in this case, it it is going to flip from a negative slope to a positive slope. That's impossible to have a derivative right at that point then. That's how you do these problems. I maybe can try and do one more of this kind of this one. So now we're going to try to draw a tangent line. Um, this is what you can imagine is happening. Um, you know, something like that. Again, this is going to have a negative slope, and so that's what we're going to want to choose. And we can submit that answer. And then you can see in the graph that I didn't draw it quite, quite right, but I had the right idea. The main idea is we just want to know the direction of the slope. Oh boy, yeah, we're not doing that in our class at all. So if you get something that looks like this, you would have to say that um, the slope is approaching negative infinity from this side and positive infinity from this side. There's a gap there. Um, so if the function's not defined there, then the derivative of the function is not defined there either. So we would have to say that's undefined. Okay, they wanted us to actually say there is no tangent line. Okay, sorry, in my mind that means the same thing. Okay, here's an example of one I want to show you um, where we're going to be talking about um, the tangent line at negative 2. And this is something that we're going to be um, running into um, next week uh, when we cover this top, or it might be after spring break. But... Um, what I want to show you is that the tangent line here, I didn't know that they had these in these problems, but um, it's fine. You get exposure to it. It's actually vertical. 
And if you are able or if you're curious, kind of like what's another way to kind of know that or see that is that this is concave down here and this is concave. Oops, this is concave up here. So when it switches from concave down, right, so this is like does not hold water and this holds water, it's going to go through a vertical, it's going to go through a point where you have a vertical axis. And um, what we know about um, when you have a vertical tangent line at that point, it's uh, the slope is undefined. So that's another kind that you might see. Another um, type of problem that you might see is a um, situation where like this is wants well, the slope of the tangent line at three. So let's go ahead and draw that in here. So this is concave down here and this is concave up here. And when it switches over from concave down to concave up, it's either going to have a vertical, a point where you have a vertical tangent or in this case, a point where you're going to have a horizontal tangent. So right at three is where that point is, where we're switching from concave down to concave up. And when we cross over like that, that's actually a horizontal line and that has a slope of zero. Okay. So I wanted to give you just a flavor of some of the weird ones that uh, unfortunately are included in Delta Math and why they are, why they make sense. And they're sort of foreshadowing of where we're heading. So I don't mind them being there. I just um, didn't realize that they were there. Okay, so that's it.